Central Avenue in Albuquerque, New Mexico, part of fabled Route 66. But the old romance of the open road now competes with the confines of modern reality. Some call this area the war zone. Um, central right here, there's like a bunch of prostitution. Girls walking up and down the street. And then sometimes you'll find needles on the sidewalk. Three years ago, Roxanne Sosi decided it was time to escape the war zone. 28 years old, a single mother with four children, she had just gotten a $15,000 a year job. There was a catch though. It required her to have a car. I'm a caregiver at a home with six guys that had HIV. That was the main thing. I needed a vehicle to take my clients to their appointment, to get groceries, to pick up their prescription, get, you know, whatever they need. She had no credit and little cash, but just a block away from her apartment was an attractive building with a lot full of cars and something else a bright orange and blue sign offering credit. So I went over there and when they told me, yeah, you can leave with a vehicle, and I was like, I guess I'll stay here and get one then. And I was really happy. I cried, I was like, oh my gosh, I got me a vehicle. Consumers like Roxanne Sosi have little money individually, but together they number in the tens of millions and represent a massive pool of wealth. And there's what amounts to an entire industry devoted to seeking riches in their pockets, one customer at a time. That day at the Albuquerque used car lot, Roxanne Sosi got herself a 1999 Saturn. It had 103,000 miles on it. The purchase price, $7,922. She bought it entirely on credit. Her payments, $150 every two weeks. Her interest rate, 24.9%. Within months, she realized that what she thought was her ticket out was actually weighing her down. Her family couldn't live on what was left over after she made her car payments. She returned the Saturn to the people who sold it to her. I was sad when I had to get back. That was my first vehicle and I was, you know, proud, you know, I did this on my own, but after all this happened, it just crushed me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm back to square one again. For Roxanne Sosi, that would have been the end of the story. If across the country in Atlanta, a colorful ad hadn't caught the eye of a commuter on his way to work. You can't help but notice it. It's bright, it's orange and blue. And there's a bright smiling face of a pretty young girl. And the ad says, get credit, drive today. But there's an asterisk, and it says, subject to approval. It talks about $399 delivers, i.e. $399 down, delivers the car. But there's two asterisks next to that one. The ad says, by purchasing a car, you can rebuild your credit. But there's three asterisks after that one. Sitting on the train every day, you know, over time, I read all the fine print, and I, it just stuck with me. Financing for all. No credit, bad credit, no problem. What does that mean? Brian Groh is a reporter in Atlanta for Business Week magazine. It was late 2006 when that advertisement with a slew of asterisks caught his attention. Soon after, a think tank report arrived on his desk. As he read it, Brian Groh began to connect some dots. Matt Fellows at the Brookings Institution published a report called From Poverty Opportunity, how more companies were looking at low-income Americans as a very attractive business opportunity. It sort of defies conventional wisdom that the low-income consumer is a segment of the market where most companies wouldn't want to play. And it was pretty powerful and fascinating. I've estimated in my research that among the bottom 25% of households, they're collectively bringing in about $650 billion every year. So you can imagine why 
amount of money that large is attractive to a great variety of businesses from large financial services companies to new uh, to entrepreneurs looking for innovations to serve this market. That the poor can be lucrative to big business was intriguing enough to the reporter. But Matt Fellow's evidence for that case was even more so. The Fellow's report noted that wages have been stagnant for years. To compensate, the working poor are buying items small and large by taking out loans from companies all too happy to lend them the money at a very high rate. Lower income families tend to pay higher prices for nearly every basic necessity, from groceries to the price of a car uh, to the price of a mortgage. Between 1989 and 2004, they borrowed about 240 percent more debt than they did in 1989. So there was this enormous increase in the amount of debt held by low and moderate income households. Business Week may be considered an unlikely publication to take on a poverty investigation. Based in New York City, it is a magazine that, like the corporations it covers, has traditionally viewed the world from the top down. But the think tank report hinted at a story a business magazine could embrace, an industry based on poverty serving 25% of the American population. The aha moment was that we could show that marketplace could be exploited, both in the neutral sense of exploited, just profits could be found, and exploited with the connotation of people being taken advantage of. One player which for Business Week epitomizes what the magazine calls the poverty business is the company that sold Roxanne Sosi her car. The company with the bright orange and blue signs. It's called J.D. Byrider. When you go to a J.D. Byrider lot, if you're paying attention, then what will strike you as different is that there are no prices on the cars, which for most people would be, what, how, why? Their method is quite creative. The price on the car, like the interest rate, depends on what they think they can get out of you. So they basically debrief their car customers to a much greater degree than you'd imagine. The company uses sales techniques that brought lawsuits from attorneys general in Kentucky and Ohio, alleging that customers were being misled. The Kentucky case created a public docket that included J.D. Byrider corporate papers. So in the Kentucky attorney general's lawsuit, they introduced evidence from the J.D. Byrider operations manual that points to a system in which sales staff are encouraged not to discuss the price of a car when a prospective buyer comes in. What sales agents do is try to learn everything they can about the earnings, spending habits, and credit history of the customer. Then they crunch those numbers to create an extraordinary financial profile. It's difficult, I think, to underestimate how significant this ability to analyze and share and gather data has been on illuminating business opportunities where they might not have been seen in the past. What that has allowed these businesses to do is identify the specific risk level of an individual and do so in a nanosecond. That is an incredibly powerful innovation in the market. And that's exactly what J.D. Byrider says it uses the information for, assessing its credit risk with each customer. Consumer advocates say something else that the company's software decides how much it can get someone to pay for one of its used cars. The software program is called the Automated Risk Evaluator, A-R-E. Here you go. Take a look. This is great. This is the beginning of A-R-E at Byrider. So this is the form that they fill out on the individual borrower. In this case, they blacked out the name. During a visit to J.D. Byrider headquarters in Indiana, Brian Groh was given a revealing document, a completed customer form, the kind Roxanne Sosi would have filled out. I remember the CEO said to me, I probably shouldn't give this to you. Look at what the analysis tells you about the individual. It's, it's fascinating. This individual rents and pays $300 a month in rent to Marco. That's their landlord. Spends $75 a month on groceries. Spends $64 a month eating the dollar menu at fast food chains four times a week maximum. 
has no home phone, does not purchase clothes, rather uses hand-me-downs. $345 on the car payment to J.D. Byrider was going to be by far the biggest payment that the individual had per month. And if you add in the insurance costs, they were going to be paying in total insurance, car payment, but not gas, $546 per month. Oh, and this is interesting too, they're making $8 an hour wherever they may work. After buying a car from Byrider, that individual had $67 left over per month. And I actually said to the Byrider CEO, that's pretty tight. Uh, he acknowledged it was. Byrider's critics contend the system is unfair to consumers with limited means. They call it opportunity pricing. Opportunity pricing is a way of setting the price second. First thing you do is you figure out what somebody can pay, and then you figure out what the payments they can make are and work backwards to the price. Online, J.D. Byrider denies that its application process affects the price of its cars. Byrider goes on to say, Our core business is selling good cars to people who need credit. By providing affordable financing, and we make sure it's affordable, we can enable those customers to advance in life. But what if a customer like Roxanne Sosi finds herself falling behind and has to default on her loan? For companies like Byrider, defaults are acceptable, even profitable, according to Matt Fellows. For instance, there's a used car business out there that knows very well when it's selling a car to an individual that that individual likely will not be able to hold on to that car for the duration of their loan payment. And so therefore they'll return the car after a few months into the duration of the loan. But that's okay with them because they've charged a high enough interest to cover the costs associated with that car being returned before the end of the loan. In other words, Byrider has sold a car, made a profit on the loan, and gotten the car back. What's more, Business Week would report that nearly half of Byrider's Albuquerque car sales don't result in a final payoff. Byrider knows it can repossess cars, assuming it can find them, and resell them, which it does. That cycle appears to be part of a successful business model. In 2006, J.D. Byrider's 131 dealerships, most of which are franchisees, reported total sales of $700 million. The average gross profit margin at the 10% of stores which are company-owned was a robust 37.25%. There was a map that had all of these colored pins on it, and I asked them, what is this? And that's their expansion plans, 372 additional franchises it aims to open from California to Florida. It said this business model works, despite the type of consumer that they're selling to. That map absolutely suggests that there's money to be made in poverty. Making money off people in need of money has always been around. Pawn shops ready to take valuable goods for a song, Storefront operators willing to cash a paycheck on the spot in exchange for a cut. But now, Business Week was finding, it was all going big time. That kind of business was now franchising and getting much, much bigger and much more sophisticated and employing the modern tools of credit technology, the ability to look at your financial profile. And they're big businesses where the product is often the loan Business Week would also report that mainstream banks are helping fuel what the magazine calls an explosion in subprime lending to the working poor. For example, Bank of America Corp. provides a revolving credit line of up to $110 million to J.D. Byrider. Wells Fargo and U.S. Bank Corp. are offering what the magazine called their own versions of payday loans to people in need of quick cash, charging $2 for every 20 borrowed. The annual interest rate, based on a 30-day repayment period, 120%. A buyer in a difficult circumstance takes out a loan. A company provides it at a high rate. Criminal 
or simply a case of caveat emptor. Let the buyer beware. Companies can often stay within the law and still basically exploit the unsophistication of their borrowers. A lot of financial misbehavior stops well short of something that can be prosecuted criminally. Or to put it differently, clever financial engineers don't necessarily look like a guy with a gun going into a bank. And often the perilous aspect of the loan will be hidden in fine print, or it may just be a person taking advantage of another person, which isn't always illegal. Business Week would learn that even nonprofit hospitals are getting into the poverty business, making deals with companies that transform medical bills into consumer debt. As we were reporting, we would see credit reports of some of the people we talked to, and on those credit reports inevitably was a hospital bill. Oh, oh I went to the emergency room and I didn't have insurance and I'm paying that bill. Has ER bills on credit outstanding of 1,328 and 318, but is making $25 monthly payments, they said. In America, there are now close to 50 million people without health insurance. At hospitals, they are called self pay patients. And each year, they ring up hundreds of billions of dollars in services. Money paid off slowly, if at all. For American finance firms, that kind of money cannot be ignored. Business Week found some are now pitching their services as hospital debt collectors for a cut of the self-pay pie. Hospitals are now operating much more like other businesses. They don't want to settle for getting their money over such a long period of time with the chance that after a while the person will stop paying altogether. They want some cash now. Lo and behold, an industry pops up that is willing to help them do that. We'll buy your loan, basically, or you'll transfer the loan to us. Hospital's happy, great, 80 cents on the dollar right now, we're, we're done. Now, the finance company or the credit card person is suddenly the one knocking on that person's door, and they're not so merciful. They're, they didn't go into the healthcare business to save people's lives, they're in the money business. Traditionally, at nonprofit hospitals, the approach has been pay what you can, when you can. No longer. Many are now requiring patients to pay their bills through interest charging third parties sometimes without the patient fully understanding what she's getting into. A case in point, April Dial, a 24-year-old woman living in rural Arkansas. April earns about $17,000. She has no health insurance. She's a diabetic, meaning that she has ongoing medical issues that she can control to the best of her ability, but can often result in sudden drops in blood sugar level that require a visit to the hospital. April Dial and her mother Carolyn live outside the small town of Malvern, Arkansas. They both wait tables at a truck stop, where Carolyn took over her daughter's shift one day in September 2007. I had worked for her that day because she was sick. And she called me from home and she was just, she couldn't breathe. You could tell she couldn't breathe. She was hyperventilating and she was in the floor. She couldn't get up. So I got her in her car. We flew to Hot Spring County Hospital. As soon as I walked in, one of the nurses looked at me. I said, she's bad. I couldn't walk, I was so weak. And they admitted me into ICU. April's mom signed the admission papers without fully reading them. But they told me, they're not gonna see them unless they sign admission papers. Well, I wasn't worried about admission papers. I was worried about her, because she comes first. I mean, no, I don't think I know of anybody that's ever went in the hospital that has sit down and read the fine print. April Dial's experience with Hot Spring County Medical Center goes way back. This is where she was born. And her three-day stay in September was only the latest diabetes care she received there over the past decade. Since her father's death seven years ago left the family uninsured, she and her mom have accumulated thousands of dollars in bills from the nonprofit hospital. But despite living on their truck stop waitress wages, the Dials had slowly paid down their debt. Hot Spring County would let you make a payment. Even if you only paid them $5 a month, you were still making a payment. And I mean, I was, I was gonna pay the bill, but I couldn't just dish out four or $5,000, $6,000 at a time. I was paying about $50 to $100 a month. 
But when April showed up at the ER in September, there were new rules. Ever since Hot Spring County Medical Center sold its past due accounts to this private company in nearby Little Rock, it specializes in collecting medical debt. I got this in the mail too. It's Complete Care Inter Incorporated. I've never heard of it before. A bill shows up from Complete Care and it's a debt owed to Hot Spring County Medical Center. But now they're charging 5.75% interest. Here, you're not dealing with sky high interest rates. But what you have is $455 minimum payments, which would be difficult for anyone, let alone a truck stop waitress. It was like a credit card almost. I mean, it was interest due. The news would get worse for April Dial. The hospital had sold not only her new debt, but her past bills too. In all, she was now told to pay off $7,300. Without knowing, she had become a debtor to a new player in the poverty industry. The fine print, which she says she didn't read, says, I agree that if payment is in full is not made within 30 days, I will have the option to pay the outstanding balance over time under the conditions set by Hot Spring County Medical Center or its billing company, Complete Care. It goes on to say that by electing to pay such balance over time, I consent to and agree with all conditions disclosed on the back of my Complete Care statement, including the charging of a fee and or interest on any outstanding balance. I was supposed to pay either 10% or I would be delinquent on my credit. You can pretty succinctly understand what their business model is. The patient becomes a consumer the minute they walk out the hospital door. They're converting the medical debt into a consumer debt. They charge interest. That, that's the mechanism for converting a medical debt into a consumer debt. For background on billing at nonprofit hospitals, Brian Groh interviewed the CFO of Methodist Le Bonner in Memphis, Chris McLean. There's a belief that, especially in hospitals, we're not very good at collecting self-pay accounts, and so that's their pitch, is that we've left money on the table. What they're really pitching there is the belief, and there, there's quite honestly some truth to it, that people will pay a credit card company first and a healthcare entity second under the belief that a credit card company will hurt their, uh, uh, their credit reputation and come back to haunt them in the future, affect their ability to get a house, affect their ability to get a loan for a car, affect their ability to get another credit card. Is everything okay? No. What's wrong? April Dial is accustomed to most of her paycheck going to pay for her diabetic care. I'm pretty tired, so if you wanted to run, you could have ran. But after learning of the hospital's new finance rules, she contacted a patient advocacy group for help. A group coincidentally in contact with Brian Grow at Business Week. Is everything okay? It's fine. In its series on the poverty industry, Business Week reported that Complete Care agreed to reduce April Dial's monthly payment to $125. And the hospital, Hot Spring County Medical Center, decided patients billed by Complete Care would no longer be charged interest. In Albuquerque, Business Week's reporting resulted in the local JD Byrider franchise reimbursing Roxanne Sosi the $900 she had paid on her used car before returning it to the dealer. The power of the national media spotlight may have forced changes in a few cases, but the bigger story remains. Exploiting poverty is now big business.